to again welcome you to this uh, 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 symposium uh, organized by the Mathematical Public Health Network and through the Fields Institute. And uh, one of the main purposes of this group and series is to provide different project and project uh, uh, members to present uh, the cutting edge research. And today is more focused on what we call project number one or contact mixing. Um, one of the purposes of this project is really to identify the impact of different interventions, including the behaviors and perceptions from the public and the decision making uh, on the uh, impact uh, on the uh, contact mixing and also try to see how the change of contact mixing will impact on the uh, outbreak control. And um, this project has multiple uh, uh, members and uh, spread across the country, especially with a, a node at the uh, uh, University of Guelph and uh, Queens University and New York University. So you heard some of the talks from other groups, including the York University group before, and uh, today is special uh, for organized and uh, delivered by the team at University of Guelph. And the leading fact member is Emin Guell. Emin is uh, uh, one of the few uh, mathematic models, and uh, she uh, had uh, training in math biology and at joint positions in both the mathematics and public health. And uh, she's one of the few models that uh, worked as a mathematical epidemiologist in the Public Health Agency of Canada. So she is a real uh, expert in the field. So I will pass on the rest to Amy, Professor Grill. Thank you, Jin Hong. Um, so yeah, it's really exciting and, and great to be able to um, join the the fields colloquium today to talk about some of the work that um, we've been doing in my team at the University of Guelph specifically um, within that kind of pillar one of the mathematics for public health um, network and that theme as Jin Hong has said really looks at contact patterns mixing behavioral types of changes that can occur and um, so we're really very lucky to have um, Gabrielle Brankston, who's a, a PhD candidate who works in our team at Guelph, who's going to talk a little bit about um, work that she's been doing as part of her PhD that really specifically looks um, at primary data collection as well as analysis related to contact patterns in Canada during um, the first year of the pandemic. But she also has done a, um, you know, an extensive amount of work in collaboration with um, colleagues at the University of Toronto, which also look at other types of behaviors that are reported by members of the public at different time points throughout the pandemic in the hopes of ultimately being able to use some of this primary data collection to inform the development of models, to inform um, models that perhaps incorporate behavior more explicitly than we previously really have done um, within kind of mathematics um, in terms of public health modeling. So um, Gabrielle has been a member of my team for quite some time. Um, she started with me as a PhD student um, early when I, when I um, was relatively new at the University of Guelph. Um, and then took a leave of absence. And then we wooed her back to Guelph um, and she worked in my team as a research coordinator, coordinating a number of large projects we had underway, um, funded through Agriculture Canada and also um, the CIHR JPI AMR um, related to um, agricultural infectious diseases and also antimicrobial stewardship projects. Um, when the pandemic started, 
Gabrielle decided that, you know, her, her first love really was, was outbreaks, uh, pandemic response, uh, emergency management types of research. And so she jumped back into a full-time PhD program um, at the start of the pandemic in order to be able to uh, do some of the work that she's going to talk about today. So I'll turn it over to Gabrielle and she can get her slides up and walk you through what she's going to talk to you about today. Gabriel, you may, um, yeah, uh, I'm muting yourself. Gabriel, you, you are muted. Yeah, mute it. Gabriel, we cannot hear you. I'm muted. There, now I'm yeah, muted. Sorry. No, I'm sharing my screen again. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, Okay, here we go. There, how are we doing? Good. You fake can. Okay, great. Yeah. There we go. We're okay. good. All right, we're good. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Amy, for the introduction. Um, that was quite an extensive introduction. Um, so as Amy said, I think, first of all, thanks for coming to my talk. Um, like Amy said, my, uh, my PhD dissertation is focusing on um, the epidemiology of COVID-19 and, and also doing a bit of modeling um, within the pandemic uh, context. Uh, today, I'm going to tell you about uh, uh, some, some of the data we've collected. Um, as Amy said, we collected um, a, quite a lot of data uh, between May of 2020 and December of 2020. So it's really the first year of the pandemic. Um, and today I'll talk to you about uh, some of the uh, contact pattern data we have. Um, and uh, this, these data have been published recently, actually just last week in uh, BMC Public Health. Um, so again, we can link to that uh, later. Uh, and, um, and then the second part, I'm gonna give you a bit of a sneak peek um, uh, in terms of the latest analysis I've done. And I, I think Amy's seen some of this, but not all of it even. So it's, it's brand spanking new. Um, so lucky you. Um, anyhow, so uh, just uh, before we dive in, um, I just wanted to outline the importance of measuring contact patterns um, for directly transmitted uh, respiratory pathogens. Transmission opportunities really exist anywhere individuals can have close proximity contact, um, including households, workplaces, uh, and schools. Uh, and because SARS-CoV-2 is a respiratory infection for which risk of transmission is higher with close proximity contact, Quantifying contact patterns uh, really helps us to understand the age and the location specific opportunities uh, for transmission. Uh, and when we construct these contact matrices, it allows us to, to estimate uh, key epidemic parameters such as the reproduction number. And it provides data for use in mathematical models, uh, which typically rely on estimates of contact patterns that have been collected in previous studies, um, usually conducted in non-pandemic times. And finally, uh, in quantifying these contact patterns during a pandemic, we can evaluate the effectiveness of, um, of public health measures. We can measure the degree to which social contacts have returned to normal levels. And we can help to direct uh, public health efforts toward age specific and lo uh, location specific settings. Uh, so what we did uh, early on in the pandemic, we, we conducted four cross-sectional surveys uh, starting in May of 2020. We did another one in July, uh, a third one in September, and a fourth one in December of 2020. And these were online surveys targeting only those aged 18 years and older. Uh, we used a quota-based sampling design using 2016 uh, Canadian census data. And our quotas were based on age, gender, and geographic region of residence. The survey instrument we used uh, was modeled on Masong and Jarvis, and I'm pretty sure everyone's very familiar with the Masong study, but just in case, um, it's, it's a, seminal, a seminal study of contact patterns during non-pandemic times, uh, which we, we use to parameterize age-specific disease models. And it's what I will refer to as the polymod study throughout this talk. Uh, and these are the data we use as pre-pandemic contact patterns. Now the Jarvis paper was modeled on Masong and uh, reported on data collected during the initial stages of the pandemic in, in the United Kingdom. The survey itself asked uh, respondents to complete 24 hour, contact, 24 hour contact diary. And for respondents with children, we asked about contacts their kids were having 
Uh, and these, con these, these questions were asked in the, the September and December surveys um, and the child related contacts were not included in the contact matrices. They were just uh, for our own extra information. Um, for the 24 hour contact diary, uh, respondents were asked to record all direct contacts made between 5 a.m. on the day before the survey and 5 a.m. the day of survey completion. So we had a full 24 hours. Um, and a direct contact was defined as anyone who was met in person and with whom at least a few words were exchanged or anyone with whom the respondent had physical contact like a hug or a, a handshake. Uh, we also asked respondents to provide information about each of their contacts, including the, uh, the approximate age of, of each contact and the location or setting in which the contact uh, um, occurred. So using these data, we constructed our contact matrices which contain the average number of contacts per day reported between members of each age group. And we adjusted uh, for the age distribution in the Canadian population and reciprocity of contacts. Using these contact matrices, we estimated the reproduction number for each of the four survey time points by using the next generation approach. And contacts, we, we didn't have contacts for uh, the under 18 year age groups. So contacts for those age groups were imputed using a scaled version of the Polymod UK. Uh, contact matrix, uh, removing school contacts from Polymog. Uh, to account for sampling variability, we generated 10,000 bootstrap samples for each of the Polymog UK and the observed contact, uh, contact matrices from surveys one through four and, uh, to provide a distribution um, of R for each survey time point. And then for fun, uh, and this was before the alpha variant became dominant uh, in Canada, we also estimated our values based on uh, what was then a theoretical increase in transmissibility to, due to the emergence of the alpha or B117 variant um, as the dominant variant in Canada. And to accomplish this, each of the scaled estimates of R were multiplied by a factor of 1.56 to provide a distribution of R estimates consistent with uh, the transmissibility of the alpha variant. So here, uh, here are the four contact matrices for each of the survey time points. Um, and this figure, uh, in the figure, the x-axis represents participant age group and the y-axis uh, represents the contact age group. The matrices show the average total number of daily reported contacts made by respondents in different age groups with the individuals in other age groups. And the lighter colored tiles indicate more contacts. The numbers in each of the tiles represent the percent reduction in contacts compared with the polymod study. So uh, comparison with pre-pandemic uh, estimates. Um, and the reason we did this was because, because disease modeling that was done early on in the pandemic uh, had shown that we needed to maintain a reduction of around 60% of contacts from pre-pandemic times in order to prevent a resurgence in cases and the numbers in orange represent average numbers of contacts that are at a level at which a resurgence in COVID-19 cases was expected to occur. So around 60% or less. So as you can see in May and July, uh, when restrictions were just being lifted after the first wave of the pandemic, uh, respondents reported few contacts on average. Um, on average, we were sitting at around 80% uh, reduction from pre-pandemic times. Um, but you can see in, in both May and July, the number of contacts in just a few age groups were creeping up to the threshold at which we would, you know, we would expect to see a resurgence. But in September, every age group had crossed that threshold for at least some of the contact age groups. And then moving on to December, fewer contacts were reported and fewer of these age groups were at the threshold compared with, with September, which, uh, which, you know, could reflect individuals reducing their contacts due to a perceived risk in response to the increasing case counts during the second wave, um, along with uh, some renewed restrictions and closure, closures in some regions. So here, the contact matrices are translated into a distribution of the reproduction number for each survey time point. Um, and if you take a look at each of the distributions, the reproduction number uh, for each survey is, re is represented by the solid line in each distribution. The estimated mean R values were just under 0 0.5 in each of May and July, 1.06 for September, and 0 0.81 for the December survey. And the other thing to note here is the dotted line in each distribution. The dotted line uh, represents a 50, the 50% 50 increase in transmissibility with the alpha variant as the dominant strain in Canada. And what these dotted lines suggested is that while control measures resulting in contact patterns 
seen in May and July were likely to be enough to suppress transmission, those seen in September and December were unlikely to be sufficient to maintain R below one when this variant became dominant in Canada. And as I mean, as we all remember, Alpha did become dominant in Canada, and we did in fact have to revert to more stringent public health measures uh, to reduce transmission. So more recently, and this is just a little add-on. Um, early in September, this September, uh, September 2021, uh, we updated these plots to account for the higher transmissibility of the Delta variant and for vaccine coverage, um, and just, just a bit of a crude, uh, crude uh, measure. Um, so we estimated that R0 for Delta was around six, which may be a bit conservative. Um, the proportion of the total population that was fully vaccinated at the time was around 70%, um, and that was, again, in September. Uh, and assuming vaccine um, effectiveness was around 87%, uh, we rerun the analysis. So this, I mean, this is really back of the envelope stuff, just to get an idea about the level of restrictions we would still need to have in place uh, in order to control the Delta variant, um, even with, with vaccinations. Um, so we, I mean, we didn't account for age groups eligible for the vaccine or, or the proportion of the population that might be immune due to infection or anything like that. So really just kind of back of the envelope stuff, uh, just to get an idea. And as it turns out, the plots look essentially the same as the original plots without variants of concern, uh, which means that even with the level of vaccination in the population in September 2021, contacts similar to those estimated for September 2020 will result in or should result in epidemic growth. So I think until we get the, you know, the under 12s vaccinated, um, if our goal is to prevent epidemic growth, it likely means stricter public health measures. So uh, these are the contact matrices for each wave of the study and the polymod study stratified by location of contact. And if we move from the top row, we have all contacts in the top row. Um, then uh, the contact made at home in the second row, work contacts in the middle, school contacts, and then the last row is everything else, which includes social contacts. And again, the lighter colored tiles represent more contacts. And in the top row with all contacts, we can see that the number of contacts was higher in uh, September and December compared with May and July, which we saw uh, in one of the previous slides. And if we look at contacts by location, what really kind of stands out here is that the higher number of contacts reported in September and December is related to work contacts. Um, the number of contacts was similar between surveys and all other locations. And, and we would have expected uh, to see school contacts increase in September and December. But if you remember, uh, the contact diaries excluded people under the age of 18 years, so we don't have those data. Uh, when we were planning the September survey with schools reopening, uh, we, we, we did really want to have some information about the number of contacts kids were having. So we added some questions to the survey about contacts in kids. We asked respondents with children under the age of 18 uh, whether any of the children in their household had attended school, had ridden the school bus, had attended uh, a before or after school care program, um, or participated in any extracurricular activities in, uh, in the week uh, prior to the survey. We then asked uh, the, these respondents to estimate the number of contacts each of their children had in each of these activities. And what we found was that uh, approximately 60 to 65% of respondents with kids reported that at least one of their kids participated in school-based activities or extracurricular activities in the seven days prior to the survey, which is seen in the plot labeled uh, on, uh, with an A on the left-hand side, if I'm not mirrored. Um, of those whose kids participated, uh, plot B shows the average number of contacts for kids in these different settings per day for school, aftercare, or the bus. Um, or per week for extracurricular activities in each of uh, the months of September and December. And these data show that, you know, kids are in contact with a lot of other people. <laughs> and uh, so we're looking at the range of about 20 contacts per day uh, in, in, at school alone. Um, so, I mean, if we, if we take a look back at the setting specific contact matrices, if we had contact diary data for the under 18 year age groups, we would see the bottom left-hand corner of the school matrix uh, light up as well. So, I mean, if we're thinking about implications of, of this, uh, there seems to be a lot of focus in, in Ontario anyway, um, on indoor social gatherings as the main driver of the second wave of, of COVID in Canada or in Ontario at least. Um, and our data don't support this. Um, our data do suggest that from September 2020 onward, workplaces and schools were, were providing many opportunities for transmission. 
Um, and while transmission opportunities exist in any setting in, in which people are in contact with one another, uh, our data emphasize the need to support and ensure evidence-based infection prevention and control measures um, in both schools and workplaces. Um, given that the more transmiss transmissible Delta variant is now the dominant variant in Canada, along with, uh, you know, a couple of the, you know, offshoots from Delta, um, our data suggests that we'll, we'll continue to see increasing transmission, even with a highly vaccinated 12 and older population. And, you know, here we are sitting in November 2021, and, and I mean, everybody's, you know, watching and, and we're now seeing growth across most of the country. Um, and as you know, as of right now, as of today, there's still a very large population of, of children under the age of 12 that are not yet eligible for the vaccine and, and are congregating in schools every day, you know, eating lunch with their masks off and, you know, groups of 25 plus. Um, and, you know, our data suggests there, you know, there still will need to be good infection control measures in place to prevent transmission in the near term. I think, you know, as one of the limitations of this, I think it's, a, it, it's really important to note here that at this point in the pandemic, a, a general reduction in contacts may be a fairly blunt tool with which to estimate uh, the reproduction number. And, um, and we, we, we certainly didn't account for personal protective measures individuals may have been practicing at the time uh, that we did the surveys. We know that the virus is airborne and we know a lot more about how to control COVID-19 than we did um, back in 2020. Um, and then in order to reduce effect, effective contacts, uh, it, it really means, you know, it, that, you know, we've got this layered model of, of things we need to do. And we know, you know, we need good quality, well-fitted masks. We, you know, we need to have appropriate ventilation, filtration in indoor spaces, um, you know, vaccine mandates uh, for certain sectors, uh, smaller class sizes in schools, um, you know, the potential for low cost or free rapid tests, you know, as well as, you know, generally limiting contacts in higher risk environments. So, you know, we talk about the Swiss cheese model of things that, you know, that we can do to, to reduce transmission. And it's not all about just solely reducing contacts, because I think, I think um, you know, in the context that we're in right now, um, just reducing contacts is, is, fairly, is, is fairly blunt. I mean, there, there are ways to mitigate uh, risk um, that, uh, you know, that we can and should be using. Okay, so just to switch gears a little bit, um, I, I have some brand new, not yet published, haven't finished writing the paper yet data to show you. Um, so I've been analyzing some longitudinal data, uh, survey data that, that we collected between June and November of 2020. So a similar time period as the contact pattern survey. Um, and I think, you know, I think we've all heard of anecdotal reports, um, and there are some data in the literature to, su to suggest that individuals may have become less motivated to adhere to public health guidance um, as, the as the pandemic has progressed. Um, and things like, you know, things like mandated business and school closures, uh, they result in regulated behavior change. Um, but engaging in protective behaviors such as, you know, reducing contacts or, or you know, re reducing effective contacts. Uh, really requires voluntary cooperation on the part of individuals. Um, and, you know, given the social disruptions of reducing social contacts and the length of time we've been asking people to reduce their contacts and, and you know, engage in these protective behaviors, uh, it, it's reasonable to expect uh, that engagement in these precautionary behaviors uh, would wane over time. So in order to uh, determine changes in risk modifying behaviors, as well as support for certain closures over time, we, um, we conducted a survey related to these public health measures in Canada, and we repeated it over five waves of data collection. So um, again, we, we uh, conducted the survey. It was an online survey conducted just with adults. Um, and the first survey was in July of 2020. And then uh, we, we had respondents repeat the survey every four to six weeks. So we have a July survey Survey one, survey two was August, survey three, September, survey four, October, and survey five was in November of 2020. And the survey asked respondents whether they had uh, participated in an indoor social gathering with one or more people from outside their household in, um, in the previous seven days, whether they avoided in-person contact with family and friends in the previous seven days, um, and whether they would support the closure of non-essential businesses or school closures in the event of a, you know, a, a further or a subsequent pandemic wave. Back when the survey was conducted, it was, you know, we were just, um, we were talking about a second pandemic wave. Um, and then we developed some mixed effects, multivariable logistic regression models to assess changes in these indicators over time 
And we controlled for um, stringency of public health measures because public health measures did vary by time and uh, by region. And we used a, a stringency index as calculated by uh, the folks at the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, and they used the Oxford methodology to, um, to, to make these calculations. And then we also controlled for COVID-19 incidents by province. Uh, and so what we used here was a seven day rolling average of incident cases per, uh, per 100,000 population. And I think, you know, I think there are some interesting findings. Uh, these four plots represent um, just a basic descriptive analysis of the proportion of survey participants responding yes to each of the four uh, indicators by survey wave. So if we take a look at um, the top left hand uh, plot, uh, the proportion of respondents that reported avoiding contact with family and friends increased over the five survey waves. And then moving across to the top right hand plot, the proportion of respondents who reported having socialized indoors with others not, uh, not in their household looks to have declined um, a, a bit over the five survey waves. If we move down to the bottom left hand plot, the proportion of respondents who would support closure of non-essential businesses looks like it increased slightly, but I don't think those confidence intervals are overlapping. So it doesn't seem to be um, maybe a true increase. Uh, but then moving over to the bottom right-hand plot, the proportion of respondents who would support the closure of schools declined over the, over the study period. So taken together, um, you know, more survey respondents reported engaging in you know, personal protective behaviors over time. Uh, more respondents supported non-essential business closures, and fewer respondents uh, supported school closures over the study period. Um, and behavior-wise, you know, it looks as though it, it's the opposite of what we would expect um, if, we, if we're, you know, if we're talking about pandemic fatigue or, or people just getting tired of, of participating in these measures. Um, but these proportions, you know, uh, don't take into account uh, public health measures or potential behavioral responses to um, increasing case counts. Uh, but when we do the regression analysis, um, this series of plots represents the odds ratios from the regression models assessing changes in each of the indicators over the five month period. And here we, we did control for stringency of public health measures and incidence of COVID-19. So if we just focus on the top half of the slide, uh, the plot in the top left hand corner represents the odds of reporting avoidance of contact with friends and family in the seven days prior to survey completion. And the plot in the top right hand corner represents the odds of reporting having socialized indoors with non-household contacts in the seven days prior to survey completion at each survey period. And that was compared, the odds ratios were compared with um, July 2020, which was the referent value in the, um, in the regression analysis. Uh, there was no significant change in the odds of avoiding contacts in any of the time periods compared with, with the July time period. Uh, in the case of gathering indoors, <clears throat> only the October survey wave, which included actually included Thanksgiving, um, showed any increase in the odds of having gathered indoors, which I think is, you know, it's really interesting because, because you know, like I said before, at least in Ontario, um, you know, and but perhaps in other regions as well, the messaging from authorities has, you know, has been, you know, or had been um, that individuals gathering in groups indoors are generally to blame for increasing increasing transmission. Um, but but these data don't really support um, this assertion. Uh, they do show that individuals were for the most part modifying their behavior to reflect public health recommendations. Um, so turning our attention to the bottom half of the slide, support for school closures declined over time, uh, while support for the closure of non-essential businesses increased over time in the regression models. So this decline in, uh, in support for school closures was reported in the context of increasing incidence of COVID-19 during, you know, during the second wave of the pandemic in Canada in, in the fall of, um, and moving into the winter of, of oh, well, fall 2020. Um, so, I mean, these data tell us that individuals, you know, they were willing to continue with voluntary personal protective behaviors, while at the same time reducing support for implementation of school closures and increasing support for non-essential business closures in the event of a, of a second wave of, of infection. And, you know, while it's tempting to think that the topic of school closures um, is important only to those with children living in their households, um, our, uh, having household children was not associated with support for school closures. Um, in this analysis, so it was it was it was really you know 
survey-wide, uh, the support declined for school closures. So, so in terms of implications, um, you know, the implications of these longitudinal data are that, you know, at least um, in mid to late 2020, both policy and increasing disease incidents played a role in the voluntary precautionary behavior of, of individuals in Canada. Um, and also that Canadians supported personal protective and community level measures over school closures and, uh, and were therefore supportive of keeping transmission low in the community to keep schools open. You know, and I, and I think, you know, just, just, to, just to wrap up, I, I think even with the limitations of survey data, you know, with recall bias and, you know, social desirability and all those, all those good things, the results from both of both of the studies um, I, I, I've been discussing today, I, you know, I think they're fairly compelling, uh, you know, Canadians, for the most part, have, you know, from our results, been doing their best to follow public health guidance. Uh, and these are the people and groups who have supported uh, my research. And with that, uh, I can take any questions or comments or. Oh, so, thank you, Gabriel. Um, I have a question that, and I, uh, I'm wondering if uh, it's okay now, um, Amy, raise ask questions. Absolutely. You can be first in line, Jin Hong. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So uh, um, I, I'm so happy that you, you conduct a survey that uh, a week prior to the, for example, open up the school. Um, but so, so this is trying, I understand is trying to be more of proactive rather than retroactive. Uh, but uh, would this have any potential uh, impact in policy in the sense that even you say we show that uh, reopening the school, for example, is going to increase in substantial risk of contact and risk, would that potentially be still possible to reverse the decision uh, since the reopened school is already uh, Decided. That's why you conduct this way, right? So um, I just want to how 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 fast this can be done this way, and how how this can be translated into uh, knowledge in terms of data collection and then analysis, and then translating it to policymakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To really impact the policy. So you know, it's it's interesting. It's, it's 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 definitely an interesting question. I mean, for me, it was not quick because you know I'm still learning and you know I you know as a as a graduate student it was not uh you know a quick um you know you have to clean the data and make sure the data data are all clean and and for me I had to learn all the all the methods and everything um but what but what they're doing so the, the Jarvis uh group the, the, not the Jarvis group the 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 group who um who were collecting data for the Jarvis paper I think they're called Comix they've been collecting this type of data um, since the beginning of the pandemic, and they're doing it—they're doing it every two weeks. And so they—I mean—they've got their um, their their systems in place where they, you know, they rapidly clean the data, and uh, and and are able to translate it up to um, to people who need to know in 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 fairly fairly quick order. So I think in terms of a maybe a graduate student project, it it hasn't you know it's it's not super quick, and it it may not. Um, it may not translate that easily, especially into, you know from an academic environment. But uh, but the Comex group has been able to to um, to streamline their their methods uh, quite a bit and are have been able to to um, to make recommendations to policymakers. I mean, having said all this, I mean we 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 were sharing these data with with the science table and um, and you know very early on, like once once I I was able to get the you know the data all cleaned up and. Uh, we shared with with the science table and with with the folks at FACT too. So, um, so it, you know, the publication came you know almost a year later. So, <laughs> it's uh, you know the academic part is pretty slow, but uh, but I think you know I think if you do have the process in place, I think I think it can be translated uh, for decision makers uh, fairly readily. Oh, thank you, Kimberly. Uh, so I, I do know that uh, your analysis is a group of your group's uh, analysis has had tremendous impact on decision making and uh, in the consideration by different agencies in Ontario and Canada. Uh, I want to congratulate you on this. I just just oh, feel you. that yeah, that pressure of getting the data and get it into the knowledge is uh, is so enormous. And uh, thank you again, Gabriel. Thank you.
Thank, thank you. That's a nice compliment. <laughs> I think I think also Amy one of the things. Day. Well, I I mean I think this is a really key question, right? Is that you know we we collected primary data during a pandemic and we um, collaborated with. Um, Peter Lowen and Eric Merkley at the Monk School at U of T because they already had a pipeline for doing this sort of work. They were already, um, you know, they're political scientists. They do this sort of survey work as kind of their bread and butter research, not for this purpose. Um, but we expedited the process significantly by um, basically adding our work onto their existing um, platform that had already undergone, you know, this this probably would have never happened had we not tagged on to their existing um, setup with the survey collection company called Dynata, because to negotiate rates, the paperwork, you know, push this through the research office for, um, you know, invoice, like for being able to get approval, because each survey is very costly, you pay per um, participant. Um, so, so, you know, the logistics of this kind of came together in a way that probably would not have otherwise. I think it does make sense, though, um, to think about this more broadly as we transition out of this pandemic, because I do think there are other ways to do this. In the U.S., there are a number of... Um, panels basically that um, social scientists use to collect real-time data all the time. MTurk is one of them. Amazon has a number of panels where basically they pay people to answer quick short surveys all of the time. And, and there are people who do this for a living. Um, you know, there are challenges with that because certainly you may not get a, a perfectly representative sample. Um, but at the same time, those panels um, do not include a lot of Canadians. So if you want to use those panels, they're much cheaper. You can turn data around very quickly, but it's very challenging to get enough respondents who are only um, respondents who reside in Canada. And so it may be worth thinking about proactively trying to recruit Canadians into some of those panels because you can action research through them very quickly in a way um, that we were not able to in working with kind of the bigger market research type survey companies. I see that Monica has her hand up. Monica? Uh, hi, yes. Uh, hi, Gabrielle. Thank you for your presentation. It was really, really uh, very nice and um, excellent research. Um, so I was wondering, um, oh, sorry, I should turn on my camera. I do exist. If my computer decides to, <laughs> um, so I was wondering um, if you if you would be able to expand a little bit on how you uh, computed the RT, the R effective. I think I believe you called it RT. Then you mentioned that you used um, like next generation matrix or something. So does that mean that you had a specific SCIR slash many other letters? <laughs> type of model in the background <laughs> for which you, you sort of extrapolated this or was it something else? No, so what it was, um, so we, we actually took the methods that the Jarvis paper used and we applied it to the study as well so we could compare. Um, so what what it was, so if, if we, you know, if we subscribe to the social contact theory, um, you know, we, we make an assumption that uh, the number of contacts people are having is proportional to, to transmission, essentially. And mm -hmm. so what we did was we mm -hmm. took the um, polymod uh, contact matrix and, um, and, uh, and the R contact matrix and R contact matrix, the observed contact matrices were, you know, a proportion of, of pre-pandemic contacts. Um, and mm -hmm. so, uh, so the the reduction in contacts translated to a reduction in the what the R would be, the reproduction number would mm -hmm. be, and then we and that's how that's how we came up with the okay um, okay got it R. yeah 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 mm -hmm. okay yeah perfect thank you thanks other questions. Anybody else? So as Jin Hong did say, um, last chance to jump in. Um, as Jin Hong did say, um, 
you know, I think that this, you know, this is work that was um, partially funded through the Public Health Agency of Canada. And so, um, as Gabrielle said, although the although the paper has just come out, um, you know, these kind of on a monthly basis, as the data were coming in, Gabrielle was um, was pushing these these matrices out to our collaborators at Public Health, so the risk assessment uh, group at Public Health, um, who were using them to to kind of um, incorporate into the sorts of models that people like Vicky and, and the other risk assessment team members were, were running. Um, we shared them with BC, um, pretty much anybody who wanted them. So, so, I mean, many people have, I mean, the paper has just come out. The, the matrices have been available publicly as a preprint for, for a very long time and, and people have been using them, which I think also changes, you know, being able to share the data as a preprint well before the paper actually becomes published. Um, is something else we've seen happen during this pandemic that previously was not a common occurrence, right. but I think in, in, in a public health crisis, it has been incredibly helpful. And, and you know, this work really was modeled on the, the paper published by Jarvis, um, which we first saw as a preprint, right? I mean, it was kind of a preprint and boy, I wonder if we would be able to do this in Canada and, and be able to operationalize it very quickly. Any other questions? Um, I was just wondering if you know about our survey at Fields that we've been doing. So we've been running that since I think it started in November uh, 2020. Um, and we're now we're just we're in our second iteration now, which so it includes questions around contacts, but also around um, uptake of vaccine and uh our next our next iteration is going to include the vaccination of children as well so it's, we tried to cover quite a spread we also have questions around whether people would um would uh, be more likely to stay at home uh, with covid or suspected covid if they had paid sick leave and questions around that so but i'm not sure if we've i'm <laughs> wondering if we've connected on these surveys or uh, but we're using Rewe, which is uh, which gives us a pretty good um, sample, and we've just kept it running. Uh, we're now in the second iteration, but the first one we kept, we kind of I think we had a break of like five weeks between the first and the second survey. So. Yeah, I should also say that Gabrielle. Um, so the first paper of Gabrielle's dissertation, which is um, published in the Canadian Journal of Public Health. Um, looked at kind of attitudes and behaviors towards some of these public health measures. Um, and a lot of that work, which um, was covered quite extensively in the media early on, was related to um, things like, you know, if you were symptomatic, would you be able to stay home from work? Those, you know, like if your child was ill, who, who is going to be able to provide, you know, who are you relying on for childcare? Um, if, if school is closed. So, so we had a lot of questions around how people were managing um, the changes that occurred very early on in wave one. And that paper has been published. And again, you know, we've been very lucky to share those data with, um, you know, the chief science advisor with, with a number of groups. Um, I think, you know, what it does highlight though, and, and it's an area that we're kind of starting to, to maybe get a little bit more into is, I mean, we really need social scientists at the table here, right? I mean, behavior change, um, you know, judgment and decision making, these are like entire entities in and of themselves. And, um, you know, collaborating with, with social, social scientists at U of T at the Monk School has been really um, an incredible opportunity to learn a lot from, from people who we don't normally collaborate with. Um, to think about behavior, to think about, you know, how to quantify behavior and the things people are doing in ways that we maybe have not thought of. And so, um, you know, I think that's one of the things also that we've learned from doing this is, um, is we need social scientists at the table. We need psychologists and, and social scientists of all different types at the table to really help us navigate pandemic preparedness moving forward, because I think they really have not been a part of the preparedness um, community in Canada, at least. And, and I think my sense is also in the US. Mm -hmm. Gabrielle, any final last words? No, I have to say, Sarah, I'm, I'm really thrilled that you're asking questions about paid sick days, because it was one of my, <laughs> my sticking points with the first, uh, with my 
first paper. And uh, I, as Amy said, I did a lot of media. Uh, it got a lot of media coverage. And I, that was my key message is that we need paid sick days for people to actually be able to comply with public health measures. You know, in the absence of that, you know, you're not going to get compliance. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that, uh, that uh, you guys are doing that. All right, so I don't know if I am supposed to throw it back to Jin Hong or Sarah for a final wrap up or. Uh, if Jin Hong is not there, then um, yeah, I can I can wrap up for just now. I think you may have just stepped out. So, well, thank you. Thank you both for a really interesting um, presentation and discussion. Um, and uh, it's great to, you know, it, this feeds so well into all of their work, these assumptions about people complying uh, to public health measures are so important in modeling without that uh, we really are we really are blind to what's actually going on out there in the population so our assumptions can be really off so that was that was really interesting and um, and yet yeah, we need to do uh, for certainly in our part we need to do more work to to make sure that our uh, surveys are speaking to each other that we can we can kind of cross check or triangulate our results to make sure that we're all seeing the same kind of patterns and responses uh, so thank you so much that was an excellent presentation and uh, we look forward to you know the continuation of this project in um, mathematics for public health thank you very much thank you thanks everybody have a good day